We've got Nick Ormrod who's going to talk about causal structure, sectoral constraints, and the quantum switch. Thanks. Um, so yeah, this, this talk is all about causal structure, sectorial constraints, and the quantum switch, and it's based on a paper that is a joint work with Augustin van Riet Velde and John Barrett. Can you and, oh yeah, sure. Um, and so in this talk, I want to do two main things. So firstly, I want to show that quantum systems can suffer from certain constraints that can have implications for their causal structure. And then I want to argue that these very constraints are actually at play in these recent experiments that implement the quantum switch. And once we account for these constraints, uh, we see that these experiments only realize indefinite causal order in a fairly weak sense. So I'm going to start by sketching a general framework for dealing with causal structure in the presence of what we call sectorial constraints. And then I'm going to go on to apply this framework in order to talk about the switch. OK. So we can start with a little intuition for what causal influence might be about. Roughly speaking, for the purposes of this talk, I want to say that causal influence is about the possibility of information flowing through a unitary process. So my notion of causal structure here is really information theoretic and not spatiotemporal. We're not directly concerned with space-like or time-like separation between um, different regions of space-time. We're rather concerned just with the possibility for information to be transmitted from one quantum system to another, irrespectively of how those quantum systems are embedded in space-time. So in particular, I'm a priori, we're fine with the possibility of time delocalized systems. And that remark will be important when we come on to talk about the switch. Okay, so that's just, a, uh, that's just an intuition for what causal influence is about. We need to formalize it. And we can start by trying to formalize it in a simple scenario that can be modeled using a unitary channel. And the idea that we want to formalize is this. So given some unitary U over there with inputs at the bottom and outputs at the top, we want to formalize the idea that no information can flow from the input subsystem A to the output subsystem D. And if no information can flow, then we'll say that A is not, um, we'll say that A exerts no causal influence on D through the unitary U. So here's one attempt to formalize that. We can say that A is not a cause of D through U, just in case this condition holds, that picture. So what's that picture saying? Well, the symbol that you see on top of the um, C, that represents the partial trace. It says that I don't care about the C output, I only care about the D output of the unitary. And then that phi on A that I'm quantifying over, that is any channel that you like on A. And so essentially what this picture says is that measurements performed on D after the unitary are independent of any channel that we apply on A before the unitary. So intuitively speaking, there's nothing that we can do to A um, that would lead to an observable change at D. It's a no signaling condition. Now, this is one attempt to formalize the uh, intuition that we discussed a second ago about causal influence. There are a lot of other mathematical conditions that you could write down, but very happily, they all turn out to be equivalent. At least all the reasonable ones that, that we can think of, they turn out to be equivalent. Suggesting that this is kind of the right idea of no causal influence. But there is still a problem with this condition. And the problem is that, so this picture is assuming that I could perform any channel that I like on A. And it's also implicitly assuming that I could perform any measurement I like on D. But we could consider situations where this isn't the case. We could consider situations where the measurements or channels that we could perform are restricted in some way. Now, given that the possibility for information flow is dependent on these channels, right, what, what I can do to A and what I can measure at D, such a restriction might uh, change the causal structure. It might change whether there's causal influence or not. And so if such restrictions were at play, then we would have to account for them with our no influence condition. But this no influence condition doesn't account for them. So a particularly interesting sort of constraint that we can consider 
is restricting ourselves to something we call sector preserving channels. So we can consider a Hilbert space, I've called it AI there, which comes with this preferred decomposition into a bunch of orthogonal subspaces. And we can consider some kind of channel, phi, acting on that space. And now we can consider the restriction on that channel that it has to map each sector in that decomposition to itself. So if we feed phi some state uh, that is wholly contained inside the first sector of that decomposition, then we're going to require that phi spits out another state that is also in that first sector. And if phi satisfies these constraints, then we call it a sector-preserving channel. And now we can generalize that idea of no causal influence from earlier to situations where we only have access to these sector-preserving channels. And here's what it looks like. So this is something that we, um, this is an extension of the usual um, circuit diagrams for quantum theory. We call it a rooted circuit. Uh, but you don't need to worry about the, the details too much. Essentially what's going on here is that I'm quantifying over all channels phi and psi. Well, sorry, actually, crucially, not all channels, um, just the sector-preserving channels. So phi has to preserve the sectors of A, and psi has to preserve the sectors of D. And so what this condition essentially says is that sector-preserving measurements on D are independent of sector-preserving channels on A. It's precisely the same intuition as before, but now updated to the case where we've just got these sector-preserving things. Now again, this is one way of formalizing an intuition. There are several other ways you could attempt to formalize it. And in our paper, we lay out a number of them pictured here, uh, and we prove that actually they're all equivalent, which is good news because it suggests that there really is a clear standout notion of no causal influence in the presence of sectorial constraints in quantum theory. It seems that we have the right notion. Okay, and here's another piece of good news for the, uh, for the program. That notion of no causal influence gives rise to a notion of causal structure. And it turns out that that causal structure can always be represented with a very simple directed graph where the nodes in that graph are just the input and output subsystems to your unitary. Now, in our framework, this is really something that we derive as a theorem rather than just assuming it a priori. And roughly speaking, what that theorem says is that the causal relations between arbitrary combinations of input subsystems and between arbitrary combinations of output subsystems of the unitary, those sort of composite causal relations are all fixed. They're all uniquely determined by these elementary causal relations between the individual subsystems. So we can represent those causal relations between the individual subsystems using these arrows in this diagram, and then the entire causal structure, uh, including those, more, those composite relations, is gonna be fixed by this diagram. And as well as just making our lives kind of easier on a practical level, I also think that this theorem makes a pretty nice point conceptually, which is essentially that even though quantum theory is really famous for entanglement, for the non-separability of its state space, it is nevertheless true that its causal structure is kind of separable, right? It decomposes into these elementary causal relations. Anyway, so here's something else we can do. Um, recall that when I was defining um, this more generalized no influence relation, that involved breaking down the Hilbert space, the Hilbert spaces into this, um, orthog this decomposition of orthogonal subspaces. Now using those decompositions, we can make more precise statements about the causal structure. So rather than just asking whether some input subsystem A is a cause of some output subsystem D, I can now ask more precisely whether the third sector of A is a cause of the second sector of D. Or I could ask whether the third sector of A exerts a causal influence over which sector of D ends up, uh, ends up being observed. And in that case, I would say that um, the third sector of A is a cause of the which sector information of D, represented by that DW over there. And we call these more detailed no-influence relations the sectorized no-influence relations.
And they also give rise to a notion of, of a causal structure. We call it the sectorized causal structure that can also be represented with a simple directed graph, where now the nodes can correspond to individual sectors and the which sector information of my system. Okay, so at this point, if um, I give you a unitary channel, you've got these two levels of causal structure. The original unsectorized one that we started with, and now this more detailed sectorized one as well. And so a very obvious question to ask is how these two causal structures relate to one another. And the answer is pretty nice. The sectorized causal structure is really a fine graining of the unsectorized causal structure. So what do I mean by a fine graining? I mean that the sectorized causal structure fixes or it uniquely determines the unsectorized causal structure, but not the other way around. So I give you the sectorized causal structure, then you just know the unsectorized causal structure. Specifically, if you start with the sectorized causal structure and then you just combine all of the uh, nodes that correspond to the same physical system, then the graph that you're left with is precisely the unsectorized causal structure of the same unitary channel. Okay, and now I'm just gonna promise you that even though we've been focusing on these simple unitary channels, Really, all of these points, um, all of this analysis can be generalized to deal with more complicated processes that might have indefinite causal order. So for these more complicated processes, we can again define causal structure at the unsectorized and at the sectorized level. Um, and it's represented by a directed graph. Although now when we're dealing with indefinite causal order, our directed graphs might include cycles, right? That's how you know that there's indefinite causal order. Um, and again, these two levels of causal structure, um, it's again going to be true that the sectorized causal structure is really a fine graining of the unsectorized causal structure um, in the sense that, again, the former fixes the latter, but not the other way around. And that's it for the framework for dealing with causal structure in the presence of sectorial constraints. We can now apply that to think about um, these experimental implementations of the switch. So. There's a number of experiments that have been done that implement the switch using photons. Some of them are cited there. And um, this paper is going, sorry, this um, discussion is going to focus mainly on those first two papers uh, that are cited there. But it can sort of be generalized to the other two as well. Um, and in those experiments, what you've got is you've got these two sets of wave plates one for Alice and one for Bob. And what you do is you send your photon on a superposition of two different paths. So on the red path, the photon is going to go through Alice's wave plates first, and then it's going to go through Bob's. But on the blue path, the opposite is true. It goes through Alice's wave plates first, uh, sorry, Bob's wave plates first, and then Alice's. Now, each of these sets of wave plates are designed to implement a unitary transformation on the photon's polarization degree of freedom. And so the net result of this is that the overall uh, transformation experienced by the photon on the tensor product of its path degree of freedom and its polarization degree of freedom is this thing uh, over here. So on the, um, if you're on the red path, then the polarization um, experience is UA and then UB. And the opposite happens if you're on the blue path. And we call this function that takes us from the two wave plate unitaries to the overall transformation, uh, we call that the quantum switch. OK. <clears throat> so I'm not intending to dispute that this transformation really is um, the actual transformation that the photon experiences in the experiments that have been done. I believe this is accurate. And so, correspondingly, I do believe that these are implementations of the switch, right? The switch tells you what happens. That's, it's true. However, despite that, I do want to argue that there is a problem with using the switch as your model of the experiment if you're interested in the causal structure of the experiments. So it does describe what actually happens, but it's not the best tool for reasoning about the causal structure. And the problem is that the switch does not capture uh, all the physically possible transformations that Alice, for example, can implement. 
So there's a space-time diagram of the experiments. And as you can see, Alice receives her photon at two different times depending on the path. Now, as far as I can tell, this suggests that it's physically possible for Alice to coherently control her unitary based on the path degree of freedom. Because she can just put in this set of wave plates at this time and then change to another set of wave plates at a different time. But the switch, of course, forbids this, right? Because we're assuming that UA is the same on both parts of that expression. So there's this physical possibility that the switch doesn't allow for. Okay, but you might very reasonably ask, why does this matter? After all, in these experiments that have been done so far, Alice just does do the same thing on both, uh, on both paths, right? So it is accurate. And in that case, what on earth could the problem be with using this as a model? And to answer that question, I want to return to the intuition for causal influence that we started with. Causal influence is the possibility of information flowing through a unitary process. It is about how information can flow and not just about how information uh, does flow. Uh, and to the extent that indefinite causal order is really a topic in the foundations of physics or, or in physics more generally, I think the relevant notion of possibility here has to be something like physical possibility. So I don't think we should be interested in um, a sort of technological notion of possibility where you know, we might say that something is impossible because it's very hard for us to do, um, or a notion of impossibility where we say that something is impossible because, simply because we sort of refuse to do that in the experiment. The relevant notion should be physical possibility, by which I mean something like in principle possibility according to the laws of physics that govern the experiment. And the temporal structure of the experiment I described ensures that there is a greater range of physically possible transformations um, for Alice to perform than is accounted for by the quantum switch. So the quantum switch isn't, ca isn't capturing all the, all the possible ways that information can flow, and therefore we cannot assume that the quantum switch is going to provide a good tool uh, for probing the causal structure of the experiments. So if that argument goes through, then what we need is a more general model of the experiments. And this can be provided by something that we call the rooted switch. So all we do with the rooted switch is we give Alice and Bob access to the control qubit. We let them do something different coherently based on the path. And then we can calculate the overall transformation as a function of Alice and Bob's uh, unitaries using this thing we call the rooted switch. And the rooted switch essentially gives us the same transformation as the uh, original quantum switch, except now we're letting UA and UB vary based on the path. Now, I'll just point out that in order to maintain the consistency of this model and to prevent grandfather-type paradoxes, we've had to assume um, that we're dealing with sector-preserving channels. So we're not going to let Alice map the blue sector to the red sector, because that would be something like Alice um, sending information back in time, uh, which um, would lead to grandfa grandfather-type paradoxes. So in order to have this more general model and keep it consistent, we're using sectorial constraints. And what this means is that the rooted switch is exactly the sort of model which our framework um, can take in and then spit out its uh, causal structure. So we can ask, what is the causal structure of the rooted switch at the unsectorized and sectorized levels? And at the unsectorized level, this is the causal structure. It's precisely the same causal structure um, that we would attribute the standard quantum switch, where there's a cycle between Alice and Bob indicating indefinite causal order. Uh, so at the unsectorized level, we do sort of have indefinite causal order. But here's the critical thing. When we break Alice and Bob apart into different sectors based on the way the rooted switch was defined, we find that this cyclicity disappears. So in this more detailed, sectorized level of the causal structure, there is no indefinite causal order, and there are no loops. And remember that this sectorized thing is really a fine graining of, of, of this original unsectorized thing, in the sense that when I combine 
um, the B nodes and I combine the A nodes, precisely what I'm left with is this causal structure. So we've got this more fine-grained causal structure, which is, um, has a definite order and doesn't have cycles. And it fixes and thereby kind of explains the cyclicity in the coarse-grained causal structure. And for this reason, we conclude that um, the rooted switch and these experiments only exhibit indefinite causal order in a weak sense. So let me clarify the argument slightly. Our framework gives us these two levels of uh, causal structure, unsectorized and sectorized, which enables us to make a distinction between two strengths of indefinite causal order. So we'll say that we've got strong ICO when we've got cycles in both levels of the causal structure. So the indefinite causal order is kind of irreducible. On the other hand, when we've only got indefinite causal order at the unsectorized level, but it disappears when we do the fine graining, then we're just going to say that we've got weak indefinite causal order. Because the indefinite causal order that we do have um, has an explanation in terms of coarse graining a more detailed uh, acyclic causal structure. The rooted switch, our model, exhibits ICO only in the weak sense. And since we think it's a good model, or at least a, a better model for causal structure than the standard quantum switch, we conclude that the experiments themselves only realize indefinite causal order in this weak sense. Okay, and just before closing, I want to try to clarify the argument a little bit by contrasting it with a different argument um, due to Pankovic and others. Um, to the effect that uh, indefinite causal order is not realized in these experiments. So, in the paper with uh, Pankovic, there the starting assumption is that your causal relations should obtain between things that are localized in space-time. They actually assume that the causal relations are between space-time points. Um, and based off of that assumption, uh, they, they demonstrate that these experiments are not, um, uh, don't exhibit indefinite causal order. But the key thing is we make, so in this talk, I've made no analogous assumption, right? There's been no step in the argument where, where we've assumed that our, call, our causal relata have to be localized in space-time. Rather, the argument is to say um, the spatiotemporal structure of the experiment has implications for the way that information can flow. So it's got impl implications for the information theoretic causal structure. And in particular, um, accounting for these more general possibilities for information flow that are enforced on us by the temporal structure, um, that leads us to show that we can fine grain the information theoretic causal structure uh, in order to argue that ICO is only realized weekly. And that's it. Thank you. Thanks for that very nice talk. Um, we've got a, a question on Zoom. Are these sectoral preserving channels a known class in the resource theory literature? I'm not sure, okay. to be honest with you. That's an answer. Um. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I'll take um, a couple from the room. Uh, it was all on this row. I like you guys, you coordinate. Um, all right, Alistair first. Thanks. Um, yeah, thanks for the talk. So at the when you started talking about the implementations, you said you're just going to focus on these particular experiments. Is there something that would stop this argument applying to the other experiments? Are they kind of different in some sense? Or? So there's one experiment in particular where you have to be a bit more careful, and the argument that we've made here doesn't immediately generalize. So um, a key step in this argument was to say, well, look, Alice receives the photon at two different times, and therefore she could do something different based on the path. But the experiment um, by Goswami and others, um, in that experiment, the photon has a very long coherence length. So it's very spread out in the direction of travel. Um, and so uh, the, 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 the times at which the photon passes through on the two paths, well, they're not well defined. They're, they're, there are long periods over which the photons pass. And they overlap so much that you can't really make a distinction. Um, and in that argument, uh, sorry, in that experiment, 
for that reason, the rooted switch would not be a good model. Um, it's not the case that Alice can just, you know, it's not, there, there, there's not this time delay between the two photons entering that give Alice an opportunity to pull out one set of wave plates and insert another. Um, and so the rooted switch doesn't work. Is, is there a reason you have to focus? Is there a reason you have to focus on time? I mean, in that case, it's the polarization that's the control, I think. Uh -huh. And if you want to focus on what Alice and Bob can physically do, could you not imagine they can physically access the polarization and do something on that and therefore have access mm. to the sectorial information? Yeah, no, that's a good point. Um, yeah, very possibly. Thanks. Yeah. Thanks, Nick. Great talk. Uh, great result. So I was wondering uh, about um, the fact that you have uh, uh, you have only the if direction, let's say. So from the sectorial um, causal structure, you can always get the unsectorized yeah. if, if I use the right terms. Uh, but so so let's say that you're given a unitary, you can always define the un unsectorized uh, causal structure, right? So is is that correct? You can yeah. always define. Yeah. For every unitary, right? For, for every unitary, there's a well-defined unsectorized structure. And from that, you can always get the, the, the unsectorized from the sectorized. So from, for a unitary, you can define the, uh, the sectorized yep. for any unitary, yes. right? And from that, you can get the unsectorized. Yes, exactly. So there's okay. only one thing you... Uh, yeah, I give you a unitary. You can calculate its um, sectorized causal structure mm -hmm. in a well-defined way. And then once you've done that, you don't need to look at the unitary anymore. You can just coarse grain your sectorized thing, and mm -hmm. and you have the unsectorized one. And, and, and do you know if it holds also for unitary extensible ones? Does this hold for unitarily extensible processes? Yes. Yes. Do, um, do you maybe have any idea? Well, so I think the approach. No. So, yeah. So, so so these results, um, we very much focused on the unitary case, mm -hmm. and a lot of what I've said does not generalize um, beyond the unitary case. Um, this is because um, our approach involves the assumption that causal structure really exists at the level of unitary transformations. Um, the signaling structure of CBT maps imposes constraints on the causal structure, but, uh, but no more. Thank you for the great talk. Um, so I just have a clarification question. Maybe if you could go back to the slide where you first explained that the sectorized causal structure is a yeah. fine-grained yeah, this one. So I was just thinking, if you start from the coarse-grained one, in the coarse-grained one, yeah. in principle, you could have a common cause between B0, B1, and like BW, right? But in the fine-grained one, you don't have. They are. Yeah. So it, how is this a correct fine-graining? Like because in, mm. it seems like the coarse-grained one is more general because you could have this common cause. I think this is um, I think I think this is a, a pretty general aspect of causal modeling that in, in, in a more coarse grained picture you can yeah you can have um, D and E being related by a common cause but then when I take a more detailed approach I'll find out that they're not. Um, because basically I can take that common cause and then I can split it into a part that is causally responsible for D and a different part that is causally responsible um, uh, for A. Um, so I think, I think these two things are consistent with each other. Um, I don't think there's a... So like for a given coarse-grained causal structure, you could have multiple different sectorized like fine grained. Um, yeah, 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 okay. indeed. Um, given if all I tell you is the coarse grained causal structure, then there are many different uh, sectorized causal structures that are compatible with that coarse grained structure. Yeah. Right. Thank you. Um, uh, whilst the next speaker sets up, um, I've got a question, another remote question, which is what are the physical motivations to study these sectoral preserved channels? In which situations or experiments do they emerge as fundamental? It's so fundamental. Like, yeah. Yeah. No, it's a, it's a really good question. So um, uh, I would say they're not so fundamental in um, these implementations of the switch because you could take an even more detailed perspective than the rooted switch, um, uh, in which your systems correspond to space-time points, and then you know you're not necessarily going to have these sector-preserving channels. 
Um, in terms of more fundamental applications of the sector preserving channels, perhaps in the context of super selection rules. So sectorial constraints are, um, uh, at, well, as, as far as we're able to tell, tell, and we've not worked on it in great detail, they're useful for modeling super selection rules. And depending on how fundamental you think super selection rules are, sectorial constraints might be that fundamental. Um, great, thanks. Let's thank Nick again. So, Augustine's going to talk about consistent circuits for indefinite causal order. Hi. Uh, yeah, thanks everyone. Uh, thank you to the organizers for organizing this wonderful conference. So, I hope you liked Julian Stuck this morning, and I hope you liked Nick Stuck because he's more of the same subject. Um, so, this is about a paper that we put on the archive a week ago with my co workers, Nick Onward, who you might know. Lee Christensen and our supervisor John Barrett here at the University of Oxford. So to give you the basic slogan, the point is, we, is that we propose a systematic and a graphical method that allows us to build the, the higher order processes and in particular the ones that feature this, this interesting phenomenon of indefinite causal order. So in a nutshell, what we have is a graph with a bit of additional information. You just have to check that it satisfies two principles that we pinned down, and then you can infer that anything that shares the connectivity of this graph forms a valid higher order process. Okay, to understand all this, we need to rewind a bit, and we need to rewind to quantum circuits. The idea for quantum circuits is basic. It is that you have a bag of channels, and you want a way to plug them together, to combine them into a wider architecture. And the first reflex you will have, probably, is to wire them in parallel and in sequence. And that's what quantum circuits um, formalize, basically. They, they tell you how you decided to wire your stuff. And as we probably all know, this always yields a valid higher order process. That is, whatever channels I plug into these slots that you can see in the right, on the right, uh, this yields a valid a quantum channel. And this is due to the fact that quantum theory is a symmetric monoidal category. Now, this begs the question, is it the only conceivable option? Is it the only thing we can do? And the answer, at least at the mathematical level, is no. There are other things you can do. And the way people formalize that is that they look at so-called supermaps, which is the object you see on the left, which is an object that takes in two operations, which I can call Alice's operation and Bob's operation, and it just combines them together to form a valid operation. Uh, this is also what people call a process matrix. A process matrix is the CJ representation of a supermap. So supermaps have to be valid, that is, always map channels to channels. And you can find some valid ones that are non-ordered. And the switch, typically, that you've heard about is a prime example of that. Uh, as you've heard, the physicality of these supermaps is a matter of debate in the literature, and I just want to say... Uh, you can uh, let out a sigh of relief because I'm not to be going to be talking about the physicality for once. I'm rather going to be talking about uh, the way to represent them, at least mathematically. And once you care about representing them mathematically, you see that there is, of course, a difference with circuits because circuits had diagrams for them. So you could directly see the connectivity and see how the whole thing works. Whereas here, the problem is supermaps or process matrices are usually just presented as abstract mathematical objects. You know, these black box, you have no idea what's going on in there. Usually it's a 64 by 64 dimensional matrix. Uh, so you lose all intuition about the connectivity. So what would be great would be to have a graphical constructive method, something that looks a bit like what you see on the, on the left. Uh, but the first... Um, problem that you are going to have with such graphical constructive methods is that, by definition, they are going to need to feature feedback loops. But in general, feedback loops are going to be an issue because they are not going to lead to valid supermaps. In general, if I put feedback loops without caring too much about it, I'm going to, the intuition is basically that I'm going to run into logical paradoxes like the grandfather paradox. I can travel along the loop back in time, kill my grandfather, then I shouldn't have existed in the first place, and the whole thing doesn't make sense. So this is going to basically mean that this does not yield a valid supermap. So a, a, basic, uh, a basic feature of any graphical constructive method would be to be ensuring consistency, that there are loops, because we cannot do without them, but that they don't lead to any paradoxes. 
But now an outcome of such a graphical constructive method would be what I was telling you about, that it gives insight into the causal structure as opposed to this black box presentation that uh, we have to deal with mostly. And what would be great also is if it would scale up, if it would just be applicable to any graph, whatever the size, um, in a, in a well-defined way. And in particular, a particular goalpost is that people have realized in indefinite causal order that there are essentially two different classes of indefinite causal order in processes. There's what people call coherent control of causal order, like the switch, and there's a stronger form of indefinite causal order which is uh, characterized by violating causal inequalities. This is, for example, the tripartite process that Julian Vex showed to you this morning. And it would be important that we should be able to capture also the second class, the, the class with strong indefinite causal order. So as you might have guessed, we propose precisely such a graphical method. And it's, it's using directed graphs, such as the one on the left, which are just decorated with elementary constraints on operations. So something rather uh, simple, no linear uh, algebra involved, for example. Then we have two principles to check on these graphs, and whatever these principles are met, these graphs yield elementary supermaps that just describe a valid connectivity, and then this connectivity can be fleshed out further to provide large classes of valid supermaps. Okay, to show you how it works, I'm going to build our best friend, the quantum switch. Uh, in, a, in a, um, a constructive manner. Okay, so I'm going to start with this rooted graph. This rooted graph has nodes which are going to be eventually where you plug your channels, where you plug your, information, your interventions. Next, it's going to have arrows which are Hilbert spaces, but not any Hilbert spaces. They are the Hilbert spaces that Nick told you about already, which are sectorized. That is, they are direct terms of subspaces or sectors. Here, for example, for the switch, it's going to be quite simple. It's going to be a direct sum of a zero sector and a one sector. And now on the nodes, you are going to implement roots, which are just relations, so, or equivalently Boolean matrices, that encode sectoral constraints on the operations you can perform on this node. So typically here, this is what Nick was telling you about. This delta that you can see next to B implements sector preservation. It basically means that Bob has to preserve the input sector of his operation and that he has to, whatever input sector he gets, he has to map it to the same sector of the output. So generally speaking, for this example, you can see that you have nothing but Kronecker deltas, and this unlocks a nice uh, shorthand graphical notation where we replace the deltas with just writing the same index everywhere. So this is the same thing written with a kind of Einstein-like notation, if you want. Okay, now our question is, is this graph valid? And to figure that out, we will need to check our two principles. Let me give the basic, intuitions, the basic intuition underlying them. For the first principle, it's instructive to look at the roots. So if I look at the root for P, it has this form. There's one input sector, four output sectors, and the only input sector is only mapped to two of the output sectors. So the intuition behind this is quite direct it is that there is a choice that is made in the past, and that's precisely the choice about who will come first in the causal order. And that's nicely captured by the root structure. Next, if I look at Bob's node, you can see that the structure of Bob's root will be of this form. And as you can see, this kind of partitions Bob, once again reminiscent to Nick Stug, this partitions Bob into two branches. And the idea of these two branches is basically that the first one is the one in which Bob is after Alice, the second one is the one in which Bob is before Alice. Now the first thing to notice is that basically if I fix, uh, just, if I just take one of the arrows in what we call a bifurcation choice in node P, it leads eventually to um, pinning down which branch of Bob is going to happen. The, and that's uh, the description of the fact that the, pap, the past chooses whether Bob comes first or second. Or of course, they could also be superpositions, but we don't need to care about them to check for uh, the validity of the graph. So this feature we are going to formalize as univocality. So there's a technical definition of univocality, but the gist of it is the following, that the choices in the roots such as in this bifurcation choice in the past, should fix 
precisely which branches happen in other nodes and which branches do not happen. And more generally, our principle will in fact be by univocality. So the idea is that the graph should satisfy univocality, but also its adjoints should satisfy univocality. So if you reverse all of the arrows, if you kind of look at everything in the other direction, univocality should be satisfied as well. That's our first principle. Now, to look at the second principle, we need to infer a second graph from this rooted graph. And that's what we are going to call the branch graph. So this might ring a bell. It's not exactly the same thing as what Nick was telling you about, but it definitely has analogies. So the branch graph is uh, the graph in which you have distinguished between the different branches of the node. So here, for example, you don't have B anymore. You have B0 and B1, and in the same way, A0 and A1. So the nodes are the branches. The solid arrows in this graph will, rep will represent the influence between the branches that you can infer from the rooted graph. So here, for example, you see that B1 can influence A1, but A1 cannot influence B1. And the, the third thing we will need is another kind of arrows, which are the dashed arrows. And the, the point of dashed arrows is, is that they capture this influence through the bifurcation choice. So here, for example, I told you that there was a choice in the past that decided whether branch B0 or B1 happened. And we are going to represent green arrows from the past to B0 and B1 to represent this type of causal influence. And the red dashed arrows correspond to influence in the reverse of the graph in the adjoint. OK, so looking at this, we don't see any loops anymore. So you might think, OK, our second principle should probably be that the loops disappear once you go to the branch graph. In fact, we can do even better than that we can, in fact, allow for some loops in the branch graph. And we are only going to allow for weak, what we call weak loops. A loop is weak if it is only composed of dashed arrows of the same color. So the point is, you can have a loop even in a branch graph, as long as it doesn't contain any solid arrows or any mixture of, of arrows of the two colors. Uh, and then we are going to be able to say that, in fact, your graph is valid as long as all its loops are weak. And in particular, this graph doesn't have any loops, so it satisfies this principle trivially. But we are going to see that precisely, uh, or, or at least so we think, uh, it is the processes that violate causal inequalities, so the stronger form of indefinite causal order that I was telling you about, these are the processes that are going to feature loops in the branch graph. Okay, so now I can show our theorem, which is if the rooted graph satisfies our two principles, then it yields a valid supermap. And therefore, we can turn this rooted graph into what we call a skeletal supermap, which is a, a supermap in which everything is left free. You just have a bunch of wires connecting your operations. And then the point is, I can just flesh out the supermap further by plugging operations somewhere, plugging little cons that kind of do local processing elsewhere. And in particular, there's a way of doing that that yields the uh, original quantum switch as described in this paper. Okay, that's how we get the switch. Now, our point is also that it scales up. Uh, and in fact, in our paper, we rebuild the main uh, currently known examples of exotic supermaps in the literature explicitly, and hopefully we manage using the roots to give some intuition for how they work. So a typical example is one of, of what's called coherent, dynamical coherent con control of causal order that was described in this recent paper, which we call the Grenoble process. Uh, the point of the Grenoble process is that you now have a past node, a future node, and three intermediate agents. And now let me explain how it works using the roots, and, and hopefully it will give some intuition. In the past route, you have now a, a tri bifurcation choice. So the past, uh, to get some intuition, the past has a choice between three options. And this basically corresponds to the fact that in this scenario, the past can choose whether the target system goes first to Alice, or first to Bob, or first to Charlie. And then, if I look, for example, at Charlie's route, what I see is this branch structure. So let me pass it. There's a first branch which corresponds to the fact to the case in which Charlie comes first. And then the point is, if Charlie comes first, he can himself take a decision, and that's the decision of who comes second, either Alice or Bob. So that's what you see in, the, in this bifurcation choice in the, in the first branch. Uh, 
Then the two next branches correspond to the cases in which Charlie comes second, and either Charlie comes second after Alice or after Bob, so these are the two branches. And finally, there's also something interesting going on in the, in the last branch, which is that this is the case in which Charlie comes third, and then we can allow Charlie, if he comes third, to forget the order about who came first and second between the two other agents. So that's this reverse bifurcation choice that you can see there. And all of this also becomes apparent in the branch graph, where, yeah, it gets, it gets a bit more complicated, but at least it's graphical. Uh, so you, you, can see that, you can see that there are no loops. So uh, this is still an instance of coherent control of causal order. You don't see any loops in the branch graph. And you can also check that our first principle is met, and therefore this yields a valid process. OK. The next example is the Lugano process, which you, could, which you might also know under the name of the baumler wolf bw process. This is the same thing. So the Lugano process is the prime example of a unitary higher order process that violates causal inequality. So this is a stronger form of indefinite causal order that cannot be understood in the way I described before, where you just have agents in the past deciding who comes next in the future and so on. Here, it just uh, doesn't have the same kind of intuition. One can think of it in terms of a voting protocol. So the idea is that Alice, Bob, and Charlie, which you can see in the past, these are going to be the interesting nodes in the end, and they can vote together, deciding who will come last in the causal order. But Alice, Bob, and Charlie only act once, and so what's going to happen is that you can allow them to get the result of the vote, or at least part of the result, and precisely know whether they won the vote, before they actually vote. So if Bob and Charlie voted for Alice, then before she even votes, Alice knows that she won the vote. I won't have more time to uh, explain this intuition, but that's something... Uh, that's something that we explain in detail in the paper that gives some intuition about this thing. And basically, one, one might think that this should, leave to this should lead to grandfather paradoxes, and the whole point is that, kind of weirdly, it doesn't. And what's quite interesting for the Lugano process is to look at the branch graph. So here, this is just a, a simplified version where we didn't show all the branches. But what's really interesting is this thing you see at the bottom. That is, there are loops in the branch graph, but they are so-called weak loops because they are only made of dashed green arrows. And that, we think, is a hallmark of processes that violate causal inequalities. So we hope we, we found a nice structural characterization of such processes. OK, so to wrap up, we have, I hope I convinced you, we have the graphical constructive method that meets the requirements I laid down at the beginning. That is, it has consistency baked in through these principles. It provides insight into the causal structure because now you can see the connectivity between things and also the roots tell you uh, meaningful information about how this process uh, behaves at the, at the basic level. And finally, it scales up because we were able to uh, rederive most currently known examples of uh, pro higher order processes that feature indefinite causal order. And that, in fact, leads us to a nice conjecture. So our conjecture is that there's a certain class, there's a certain class of supermaps which have been conjectured previously to be the physically, uh, the physically implementable ones, which are called unitarily extendable supermaps, and that all, all these class can be expressed using our method. So it's basically a conviction we have because we couldn't find any counterexample. So we'd really be interested in counterexamples. Um, so uh, proving this conjecture would be a first direction for future work. Another interesting direction would be to, to help us to, to use this to tackle the question of the classicality of indefinite causal order. No, nothing I told you about here lies specifically on the linear algebraic nature of quantum theory. I could do that as well to classical theory, and in fact, there are examples of classical high order processes with indefinite causal order, and they can be derived from our framework as well. So if our conjecture is true, it might be showing that th there is nothing specifically quantum in the logical possibility of indefinite causal order. That would be something to dig into. Another question would be that 
basically now we can move from having to painfully look at super big matrices to looking at graphs and that also unlocks the possibility to start a numerical search just ask a piece of software to do it for you to look at the processes and uh, to, to look at all the possible graphs and start checking for the valid ones uh, another interesting conjecture is the one I told you about, about the structural characterization of the processes that violate causal inequalities through the fact that they feature loops in the branch graph. And finally, now that we have laid down our two principles, it would be interesting to find a classification of all the graphs, the rooted graphs, that meet these principles and start uh, lo looking at the different types of such graphs that one could have in a more um, principled way. So that's all for me. I'll leave you with my slogan. Uh, I'd like to thank again warmly my co-workers. <laughs> and, and I'll be happy to take your questions. Alex was first. I actually put my hand up and then forgot my question. <laughs> Come back. <laughs> Alex will be last. <laughs> Any other question? Oh, sorry, Stefano, sorry. Uh, so if you go back to the result that relates valid graphs to valid supermaps. Yeah. Yeah, that one. Uh, uh, yeah. Um, this is in one direction, right? Yeah. Uh, proving the reverse direction would be proving our conjecture, basically. Maybe restricted to some class of... Do you have some subclass of supermaps where you know the reverse to hold? Do you have an idea what kind of, what kind of structures you'd have to put on your graphs for this to be? Not really. Uh, going the other way is particularly difficult because uh, there's... I mean, I, I think this is, this is a very interesting question. I think it would, it would basically require an understanding, a better understanding of the structural uh, implications of causal structure and basically the work by Robin Lawrence on causal decompositions of unit trees. I think this is ultimately what might help tackling this question. But unfortunately, we are kind of stuck with this conjecture of causal decompositions of unit trees, and I think you would need to make progress there in order to then be able to dig out uh, this structure from a, a basic supermap you have. Good. All right. Thank you. Yep. I remembered. <laughs> um, so uh, these validity um, constraints on routed graphs, can you check them efficiently? Or is it a sort of a combinatoric search? We haven't looked into that. Unfortunately, my... Uh, Competence in computer science doesn't go <laughs> very no. far and not that okay. far in particular. Um, the, other, the other thing was just a bit of a comment. They have a little bit of the flavor of Dano Srenier conditions for proof nets. This idea that you have certain nodes which are kind of marked as switches. And these conditions are basically I'll, I'll take this thing as a switch, and then for every configuration of the switch, the resulting graph has to be an acyclic thing. Uh, so that might be something uh, worth looking at. Okay, yeah, I wasn't aware of it, but I'd be very happy to discuss it. Okay, if there are no more questions, let's thank Augusta again. So, next speaker is uh, Will Simmons, going to talk about higher order causal theories and models of BB logic. Cool. Um, thank you, everyone. Um, so, yeah, this talk is about some work I've been doing with Alex on extending uh, his categorical construction. Uh, for turning a category of kind of partially realizable first order processes into a category of uh, deterministic higher order processes and showing that uh, within this category you get constructions to talk about uh, uh, causal structures and that these causal structures model an extension of linear logic called BV logic. Um, so I'm going to start with a shout out to uh, Hefromon and Ereshkov for this recent paper, which achieved uh, very similar results to what we got independently, but whereas our construction is very categorical, works abstractly for quantum theory, classical theory, and others, um, they worked specifically for 
uh, quantum theory in the Troy Jamalkovsky picture. So if you like the sound of what I'm talking about here, but want to see how that applies more specifically in quantum theory, I definitely recommend going out and checking this paper. Um, so uh, we already had a good introduction to the concept of higher order stuff from Augustan of the notion where uh, if you're taught um, quantum circuits and quantum channels, everything looks like this first order picture on the left. Every process is a single block of computation that we can treat as acting once um, once you've been given all of your inputs and then it gives you all of your outputs. Uh, whereas higher order things, uh, which includes things like quantum cones, process matrices, super maps, etc., uh, these are things that can act themselves on transformations, either taking those in as input or producing them as output. So for instance, with this picture here, you can see we've got gaps that you could plug channels or combs into to produce a new transformation. Um, so working with these higher order structures, we get a more general sense of what types of processes we're allowed in our theories. Uh, if we're going to start talking about this in terms of category theory, though, every morphism in category has a, a, a domain and a codomain, a, a kind of notion of input and output. So we do need to use some form of encoding. And like the Choi Jamakovsky isomorphism, if we have compact closure or the ability to bend wires around, we can do this freely and say, represent any higher order process we like just as a state of some higher order type. Um, so we can think of any process as just being a state producing some interface. And we can compose these by bending wires around again to connect any two with the same interface. So for example, we can encode a comb by just bending all of the input wires up and plug in any channel into that comb by composing caps and letting it all reduce. Uh, so I said we're going to try and look at this very abstractly, but, uh, benefiting from the category theory here. Um, so we want to try and capture as many operational probabilistic theories as possible when, when doing this construction. Um, so we'll assume we have this base process of unnormalized processes that we'll treat as those that can be realized on some outcome of a test. So maybe not deterministically realizable. Um, and we want it to support these higher order encoding so we can talk about these higher order processes. And we also want it to support uh, mixing of processes. So the ability to take probabilistic combinations of things. Um, so we're going to assume it is one of these additive pre-causal categories. So this is something that is compact closed. So we have the bending of wires for the encoding. We have finite products so that we can do classical choice of systems and a good a uh, good outcome of having both of these is that that actually implies we have additive enrichment. So we have this ability to take any two processes of the same type and sum them together to correspond to their uh, probabilistic mixture. And we'll also impose a couple of extra properties on, uh, on our base category to talk about what it means to be this operational probabilis probabilistic theory. So first of all, if we're going to have any hope of talking about causal structures, we probably want to be able to talk about local processes and have a notion of discarding or marginalizing out systems. So we say that every system must have a discarding process that acts nicely with our tensor products and with our byproduct structure. Um, if we have these discarding processes for every system, well, we can bend the wire around and call it a state. So every system has a uniform state. And we'd ideally like that to be normalized as well. So we would say, if we're talking in uh, quantum language, that the trace of our uniform system should be invertible, so we can normalize it. Um, the operational notion in operational probabilistic theories is this idea that we treat two processes as the same if they act the same for every test that we can apply on them. Um, so this has the similar flavor to the ability to perform tomography on our system. So we say every system A should have a kind of a set of basis states that we can always normalize. Um, so they will all have trace one, or if we're talking classical stuff, these are all probability distributions. Um, and they are jointly epic. So if two processes F and G agree on all of these basis states, then they're the same map. 
Um, if we draw diagrams in this uh, in, a, in this category, we're going to treat this uh, uh, and we end up with a closed diagram, so something with no inputs and no outputs, we're going to end up with a morphism that represents a scalar, and we will interpret this as the probability of that sequence happening in the same way as the Born rule. Um, so we want our scalars to work enough like probabilities or some abstract probability. Um, so we'll ask that this addition of um, that we have the ability to add, pro uh, add scalars together should be cancellative. We may not necessarily have negatives in probability theory in CP maps, we don't have negative scalars, but it should at least be cancellative. And this cancellative will, uh, notion will extend to all morphisms. Um, and if we freely insert all of these negatives, so we take a kind of a subtractive closure of this theory, um, this gives us a way to uh, actually safely within category theory terms, use things like linear functionals and dual bases to talk about these um, categories with positivity constraints. Um, and we also want our probabilities to be pre-ordered so we can reason about what things are more likely than others. And we want them uh, to be invertible when they're non-zero so we can, we can renormalize states or, uh, or distributions. So you will end up with our scalars being a semi-ring that's kind of like um, positive reals, or an infinite field like all reals. Um, and the final condition we're going to add is to bring in the fact that we're treating these processes as things that can be observed probabilistically, so on some outcome of a test. So if there exists some effect in our theory pi, there should exist some complement that occurs on the other outcome of a test. So there exists some pi prime such that if I were to marginalize over them, if I sum them together, I should get some scalar multiple of the discarding process. So there are several categories that are actually interesting and do satisfy all of these, um, all of these constraints. So for everything I talk about in the rest of this talk, we can be talking about quantum theory if we're taking CP star as this uh, category of processes. We can be talking about uh, probability, classical probability theory if we're just taking matrices of positive reals, um, or we can look at categories that don't have a positivity constraint. So we can look at classical affine distributions um, by taking matrices of reals. Unfortunately, it's not purely general. We can't, there are still interesting categories from the context of causality and information signaling um, that we would like to consider and don't fit into this framework. So things like RHEL, where you're talking about possibilities instead of probabilities, uh, real quantum mechanics, where we don't have local discrimination, which amounts to not having a, a basis in the way that we defined it here, um, or anything with infinite dimensional systems. Um, but given one of these base uh, categories, we can construct a category of higher order processes. Um, so we will take uh, our new system types to be a pair of one of the underlying system types and some set, set of states that we will deem normalized or valid for that type. So we do this so that we can have multiple notions of what it means to be normalized for a particular system type. So for example, where we had the, uh, the way of bending rounds wires to encode, uh, say, a channel within a state type, um, like A star tensor B, we need to distinguish between this as a encoding of a transformation versus as a genuine state of the type A star tensor B. Um, and the morphisms in this new category will be any morphism in our underlying one that preserves normalization. So for every normalized input, it gives us a normalized output. Um, so the immediate question is, well, if I have a set of states that I deem to be rep representing a sensible space, what are the contexts in which these can be deterministically applied? Um, so this is the concept, uh, this is the concept described by the dual set. So any process is in the dual set if it yields probability one for any state in my set. So it is a valid context. It makes all of those things look deterministic. So using this, we can already construct some relevant, uh, some relevant state spaces that we'd like to consider. 
for instance, the first order states, so density matrices or probability distributions are exactly the maximal set of states that are normalized when we discard them, when we take the trace, when we marginalize over the distribution. Um, and any one of our system types in this higher order category, we can map to its dual, um, to map between things that produce something of a, top, of a particular interface versus things that consume it. Now, we want, uh, in order for one of our state spaces to be sensible, we ask for it to be closed in the sense that if you repeat this dual operation twice, you get back to the same thing. And this amounts to it being asking for that space to be affine closed, or say it's uh, the intersection of affine closure with your positive cone, if you have a positive T restriction. Um, so for, for this point on, whenever you see a bold face letter, I'm talking about essentially an affine closed space. Now, how do these affine closed spaces compose tells us how we can build different kinds of causal structures and talk about them as system types in this higher order category. So the first one we can look at is uh, a, a, a minimal closed space, including all separable processes, giving us a tensor product of two system types. Um, this, uh, we have to do this closure just because separable processes themselves aren't an affine closed space. Um, and when we later get on into talking about uh, signaling of information, we will actually see that this space corresponds to the space of non-signaling bipartite processes, um, regardless of whether A and B are channels, states, cones, any kind of higher order thing. Um, this isn't the only way we can compose things uh, in parallel. We can also take uh, kind of a De Morgan jewel of this to find the maximal closed space normalized in all separable contexts. So uh, any uh, process H is a valid thing of A par B if it gives, it acts deterministically when you plug in any valid context at A and separately any valid context at B. Um, so by this De Morgan duality and the notation I've used, you can probably guess that when we come to the model of linear logic, these will correspond to tensor and par there. Um, and if we bend round one of those uh, wires or transfer it into a, a dual, we get a representation for a function space or a kind of a space of channels or transformations. Um, so the transformations from A to B is the maximal closed space that preserves normalization. So this maximal set of encoded channels, which we encode via states, as I said before, such that they are normalized when we plug in any normalized input and pass the output into any normalized context. Um, so predictably, this gives rise to a model of multiplicative linear logic. So we have the tensor, par, internal POM, all work as expected. Um, and moreover, it's a particular variant of that called isomix logic. So all of the identity systems for these different monoidal products are the same. And we have this mixing rule that says these non-signaling processes embed into the space of all bipartite processes. Um, but the title didn't say uh, multiplicative linear logic, it said BV logic. So we've got to add in another um, type of monoidal product, uh, which in the literature is typically referred to as seek to represent a sequential composition of systems. Um, so here we expect this thing to be non-commutative. So whereas tensor and par, it doesn't matter, you can switch them around. Um, this should be non-commutative because that order of composing things matters. We need to know that A happens before B. Um, it should be self-dual in the sense that if I have something that first produces an A, and then later produces a B, well, the context for that are things that should first consume the A and then later consume the B. Um, and we expect it to sit in the middle of the tensor and par in terms of how uh, states of one embed into another. Uh, in the study of logic, this came up in the context of deep inference. Uh, so uh, if you're familiar with logic, you're probably familiar with sequent calculus style stuff where all of your introduction elimination rules happen at the top of your syntax tree of your expression. Uh, whereas deep inference says, 
let's apply those rules anywhere in that syntax tree. Um, and it turns out there are theorems in this logic that you can't prove if you try and bound that depth to any number. Um, so that's why this logic has been interesting in, in history. Um, if you look at some of the rules, they, they look like normal logic rules mostly. Uh, we say that every theorem must start with some trivial system that we generate uh, from any trivial system in any context S we can freely introduce a pair of A and its dual. So this is in the, in like, in a compact closed category, you can freely generate a cup relating A and its dual. Um, and then we have various, um, uh, distribution and, uh, what's the word? Interchange laws between the different operators. Um, so there's a couple of things we already know to model this logic. So for example, um, probabilistic or regular coherent spaces, we can build a, uh, implement, uh, a model of full linear logic and extend that to a model of BV logic, uh, where we say some, uh, some say in probabilistic terms, matrix is of the sequence type. If it decomposes into a sum of local things where each thing on the right is individually normalized, and the sum of the things on the left is normalized. Um, it's already been looked at in the context of quantum causality uh, in the notion of locative slices. So if I build a kind of circuit-like diagram out of boxes and wires, and I draw a cut through it, that represents a state that is observed at that point across each of those wires. And if I can compute that state uh, without computing any partial traces, then we call that cut a locative slice. And uh, whether or not a slice is locative uh, is determined or can be reduced down to a problem in BV logic. Um, we also have uh, a nice, uh, some nice results that characterize what it means for a category to be a model of BV logic. So it has to have these three monoidal products. They have to all be linearly distributive in the right way. They have to have this interchange law and have various coherence conditions to say they all work together nicely. Um, so the question of, do we have one of these operators in this causal construction? Um, well, if we think about it as sequential compositions of things or time-like separated compositions, there's a couple of different definitions we could pick. So in the first order world, we'll typically look at things like the one-way signaling condition to say uh, a channel is one-way signaling from Alice to Bob if no matter what Bob does, Alice can't see what Bob did. So we can generalize this to any higher order setting by saying, well, H is something one way signaling from Alice to Bob. If first it is a valid bipartite process. And secondly, for every context that Bob applies, Alice observes the same local process. Alternatively, from the first order picture, um, you can describe sequential composition via semi-localizability. So this idea that we really have something local happening at Alice, something local happening at Bob, and possibly a channel passing stuff between them in one direction. Um, so again, we can generalize this to say, well, H is semi-localizable if it splits into something local at Alice and Bob with a channel between them, but this channel has to be of one of our first order system types. So by the kind of causality principle, this should be a type that only admits signaling in one direction. So we can't send any information from Bob to Alice. And finally, we could just take this um, construction from probabilistic coherent spaces and map it immediately into our construction. Um, so just generalize it as to say, H decomposes as a sum of products, processes, where each one on the right is individually normalized and the sum of things on the left is normalized. Here we have written this in terms of the subtractive closure so that within this sum of things, some of those things may be positive, some may be negative. We get a more general picture and we get something that is importantly affine closed. Um, so it's interesting to think about which ones of these might give rise to a model of BV logic and furthermore, how would they actually interact with each other in this higher order level within these arbitrary operational probabilistic theories. 
And the main result we came up with was that the interaction between these is pretty trivial because they're all the same. Um, so regardless of whether we're working in quantum theory, probabilistic theory, um, or uh, we're looking at states, channels, cones, process matrices, all of these definitions coincide at least up to affine closure. Um, and furthermore, because of that, they all have the expected properties that we expect from the sequence operator in VV logic. So we find that our category has all of these nice interchange laws, has these distributivity laws to make it a model of this BV logic. And the final thing that I'm going to mention is that as uh, we also have a nice uh, logical characterization of first order processes in a similar vein to the causality principle itself. That in these theories, um, a system has a single unique deterministic effect if and only if its space of channels on it, so including the identity process on it, um, is one-way signaling. So even the identity process can only carry information forwards in time. Um, and so we get this nice representation of the causality principle or something similar to it, just as a logical statement, as an equivalence between types. Um, so let's leave it there with a summary of the things in the talk and some extra nice results that are in the paper if you want to go and read up more on that and switch over to questions. Thanks. Uh, very nice um, um, presentation. I was wondering the slide just before that one. Mm -hmm. um, so, do I understand correctly that uh, the, the, the way that I understand this uh, sort of equation is that I can normalize, uh, that I have a constant sort of thing that I can normalize. So, it doesn't have to be one in some sense, it has to be some constant so that I can renormalize it generally, but it has to be constant uh, generally. Um, uh, not quite sure what you mean. Yeah, um, so uh, well, what I'm trying to describe is, uh, mm -hmm. so in the situation where you, where you have sort of, um, you know, this uh, logical paradoxes, uh, yeah. right? The thing is that you, you somehow you, you cannot sort of normalize uh, your probabilities actually because they sort of oscillate, uh, right? Uh, in, let's say, lower than one yes. or bigger than one. So they, they, they sort of are not constant. That's the problem, sort yeah. of the thing, right? So I was wondering if that's what, what's you're sort of representing here the fact that something is constant I can renormalize it and I can have a so the flow of information in only one direction somehow points towards a constant sort of um, yeah, right. probability so the, if that makes any sense yeah I think I get what you're talking about so the idea of normalization we have two different things of whether it is deterministic in that it kind of it's like trace preserving or it preserves the normalization versus that trace is one um so one of those you can just renormalize by applying a scalar. The other one, it might not be preserving of it. Um, and so the non-preserving of it just means that, well, it might not be deterministic, but we might be able to realize it uh, within a test. So within a binary test, this might be realized on one outcome. Mm -hmm. So this assumption here says there exists some deterministic test that we can apply such that on one outcome, we see that. Um, so that those kind of things will exist within our theory and we can talk about these kind of partially observable things but really everything in our theory is talking about fully deterministic in the preserving sense um so when i write a theory theorem like this all of these spaces here are talking about spaces of completely normalizable in that they preserve all senses of normalization um so the trace preserving channels on A are one way signaling from the past to the future, if and only if there's one deterministic effect. Uh, so, thank you for your talk. Um, what about uh, the missing connector of linear logic that is the bang operator? The of course, yes. So, um, yeah, we managed to first of all get uh a model of the additives, so all of the um, like Cartesian products and, and stuff 
uh, within this theorem as, within this theory as well. The problem of the exponentials, things like the um, the bang and the question mark, uh, we try to come up with models of those, but because you end up, especially when we've got these models like um, quantum states and uh, classical probability distributions, there will be infinitely many states within one of our state spaces. And when you construct the, uh, say, uh, bang A to represent uh, a copyable description of them, that means there must be infinitely many copyable descriptions. So that system type must be infinite dimensional in order to support that. And so we couldn't find it, or at least we presume it requires to be infinitely dimensional. And hence, we couldn't find a way to fit it into this framework. But uh, we would definitely be interested to see other constructions that may be more general that do support that. Uh, thanks, Will. A uh, quick one. Why are matrices over finite fields not a model? Uh, matrices over finite fields, yes. So there's a combination of the results of the assumptions we make that imply uh, at least an encoding of all positive rationals. So you have that I have this sum over discarding maps um, works in this way. Plus uh, invertible dimensions means that I can essentially sum dimensions and get all integers. Um, then I need all multiplicative inverses so uh, I have all fractions, and then that gives me infinitely many. Um, a question, is there any conceptual reason why you should need local discriminability for all of this to work, or is it just for technical convenience? So the local discriminability is uh, a consequence of requiring the compact closure, so the ability to bend wires around, in combination with uh, the these tomographic bases. Um, so you can actually show just from those two, you should have local discrimination. Um, so it's from requiring them. Thanks. Um, maybe one more? No? Okay, let's go to a coffee break and thank Will again.